My name is Jason Spies. I'm your host today. How are you doing? We've got a couple cameras set up here. We also have our audio back up just in case. And thank you very much. The 60,000 people at Bakken.com and the 47,000 followers at Marcellus.com. 50,000 with the Eagleford. 20,000 with the Permian Basin, 15,000 Hainsford, the Niobrara, 10,000, giving us 250,000 social media followers with Bakken and Facebook. And then, of course, we, we throw in our personal stuff, and then, boy, we're at like two, 250,002. Okay. Woo! I don't want to lose my one follower I have on Twitter, <laughs> folks. Okay. Thank God for these platforms. Uh, once again, Jason Spies here. This is the weekly Bakken get together, and we're here with Anthony. Is it Molzane? Molzan. Like Molzan. Uh, yeah. Molzan your face. Yeah. Italian? Uh, very German, actually. Oh, yeah. Molzan. Sounds Molzan. Italian. Yeah, yeah, no. And uh, Spies is German. <laughs> yep. That, yep. That's, I mean, you can't get that mixed up with much. Spies. Yeah, my grandma got pretty mad at my mom. Uh, I have an Italian first name and a German last name, and oh, that does not go well in the German community. <laughs> in fact, the word Spies has like hair coming out of the S's. <laughs> yes. We're so German. I oh, made that awesome. one up. <laughs> anyway, so uh, uh, Mr. Mulzahn, Anthony yeah. is going to be talking with us today. He's the uh, co founder and the CEO of Aegis Flow. Yep, Aegis Flow. Yep. Or. Yeah, or, or Aegis Flow if you uh, like to follow the Oxford Dictionary. So we're going to go with Aegis Flow here, but uh, that is his company, and uh, it's a pilot platform. So what we're going to talk about today is the UAS industry, and not specifically so much in the Bakken as just the industry in itself, and we'll bleed in the Bakken, but it's a good idea to kind of have a little bit of a 5,000-foot view, if you will, to understand exactly how this is going to work, because... It is going to be working side by side with the oil and gas industry. Also, uh, the state of North Dakota with the uh, higher ed system, which the governor's talked about, Lynn Helms has talked about, as well as Doug Goring, the ag commissioner. Now, uh, keep in mind, Doug Goring and the governor are two thirds of the industrial commission, which control the oil and gas rules and regulations. So, um, a lot of that stuff does tie in. Also, North Dakota is one of seven states. That is a designated test state from the federal government, which gives North Dakota a lot of leeway and a lot of play when it comes to developing the rules and regulations with the UAS industry, the UAV industry, otherwise known as the drone industry. I'm going to be using those three periodically because, oh wait, there's even a new one now with an <laughs> R, right? Well, there's there's quite a bit. I mean, I mean, and you have uh, aqua aquanaut vehicles, so you actually uh, go under the ocean. You can actually do uh, uh, stress tests of the uh, transatlantic uh, uh, internet cables, things like that. So I want to know when I'm going to get my. Okay, you know how they got the drones that take the photos and everything. Oh yeah. Where's my underwater submarine drone? Oh yeah, yeah. There are some folks that are building that. I was actually out in a collision conference in New Orleans uh, a few months back in May, and there was a, a young company that they were creating a fully autonomous, uh, basically an aqua vehicle. Could you imagine yeah. that in the ocean? How yeah. gorgeous that would be. Yeah. I mean, you know, under. Uh, It'd be cool if like a shark ate it. Yeah, and actually they were actually <laughs> trying to uh, create a way to uh, self-perpetuate to keep it uh, going a lot uh, by using the uh, flows of the water to um, extend the life of the battery to get it to go further. Oh, so, boy, that's really deep. Yeah, uh, and Microsoft is another group that was doing it but for the air to uh, use uh, artificial intelligence to detect uh, um, basically the, the thermal uh, the thermal spaces to uh, um, let these uh, planes, these these glider planes uh, uh, catch those, learn how to fly in and stay in the air uh, hmm. effectively, perpetually. So, yeah, it's it's happening uh, everywhere. So, Well, once again, this is the uh, uh, Bakken.com's uh, Facebook page here, and this is the weekly Bakken get-together, and we're going to be talking about the uh, UAS drone UAV industry. And first of all, talk about your company a little yeah. bit. Let's just set the table of who you are yeah. and what your background is and how you're here talking about this today. <laughs> So the background, well, I, um, I grew up in a small town in Wisconsin, so we don't have to talk about that. I uh, went to college uh, in Duluth. Um, I was originally going for computer science. Go Bulldogs. <laughs> yeah, right on, yeah. Um, and if you're familiar with the, the campus up there, yeah. um, the whole thing is connected by underground tunnels. So mm -hmm. um, I didn't actually go outside for like a year and a half at one point. It was pretty great. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I was going for computer science. Uh, ones and zeros were not for me, so I actually uh, finished with an art degree. Uh, paint by number was far more conducive to say. my world, yeah. One through nine. So. Yeah, exactly, yeah. And so uh, um, uh, on my journey... Uh, uh, after college, I wanted to go out west to pursue professional golf. 
actually. So I was enrolled at the academy in San Diego, and I stopped Ooh. in something called Fargo, North Dakota, when my girlfriend, uh, now my wife, uh, said, uh, you know, let's stop in Fargo, save some money. So uh, that was about 10 years ago. Got a job at Red Lobster, because uh, that's the next logical thing, and I uh, got a job uh, while serving a gentleman um, in his family, says, uh, you know, I... I build websites. He says, I have a job for you. I took the job and that was about seven and a half years ago. And I learned a little bit about precision agriculture using satellite imagery. And uh, once I moved away from that company, uh, we created this platform for pilots, a marketplace for uh, folks to sell their photos and videos and be contracted to fly. It's a mapping environment for drone pilots. How long have you been doing this? Uh, we launched our company on May 11th. Um, and I remember that because... 2017. Yeah, this year. Okay, so you, yeah. Yeah, I was very, say, very new. Most of these UAS companies are... <laughs> yeah. un unless you're Boeing or Northern Grumman or, you know, Even one of the then, big boys, yeah. you're less than two years old. For the most part. For the most part. Yeah. Probably 95% of the companies. Yeah, you've got yeah. you've got some uh, some Maverick, some heroes like uh, David Dvorak, uh, Field of View, who launched, mm -hmm. like, what, many years before is even legal to fly, and he created an entire platform out of it. So yeah. uh, you got some folks that were forerunners that helped pave the way for folks like us, you mm -hmm. know, and, and so our give back is for the, the Northrop Grumman's, the General Atomics, whoever it is in the world. They are supplying hardware. They're providing it to people who can fly for virtually any industry, whether it be monitoring oil and gas or construction or for uh, real estate, getting some mm -hmm. vanity shots. Um, we're there to have the pilots be able to contract that work and offer that content to the people who uh, purchased it. Um, so that's basically it. So uh, one of the things that Doug Goring, uh, North Dakota Ag uh, Agriculture Commissioner, and I have been talking about for about over a decade now, because I've been following these UASs since uh, 2007. Uh, I remember back when I was... Um, on a, a regional ra radio station, and I got reprimanded because I had a gentleman on, Tommy Kenville. He was on talking Tommy. about, yeah, you know Tommy. Yeah, He's yeah. like the godfather <laughs> now of UAS in the state. But back, in, two, <laughs> back in 2007, yep. uh, we were talking about how um, Israel, or I think he just got back from a trip from Israel, yep. they had drones the size of honeybees. This was back in 2007, folks. Yeah. Okay. So we were talking about the advancement of this industry, saw what was coming to the state, and here I'm getting reprimanded because it's like cuckoo, overnight coast-to-coast -coast AM alien talk stuff, <laughs> you know, and you're talking about, well, to the average person, it was, it was science fiction. And yet what we're trying to explain to people was, and this is why the education period is so tough in technology, you know, I mean, 10 years ago we were talking about how, uh, you know, Google was able to specialize ads. Well, now it's it's normal. You know, normal people expect it. But yet, ten years ago, people were getting tinfoil hatted and craziness, and like, no, that's just the way algorithms work. And so, when you start layering this stuff in, where I'm going with all of this is that we've made so much progress over the last decade. The question that I would ask ten years ago to people that were the higher ups in the UAS industry, and now this was through agriculture, so. I'm going to take out the sunflower row and put in the word pipeline interchangeably so it's the same concept. So the idea was, okay, where are we? Because the end goal is this. You want a drone to fly over a row of sunflowers or a pipeline, and it will monitor that row of sunflowers or that pipeline, and it'll say, oh, that one specific plant has one specific pathogen disease. And it will allow this little 4x4 four four, uh, uh, four-wheeler robot to drive out to that one plant and just pssst, mist it like perfume and then drive back. And you're going to save a small fortune on pesticides. You're going to save a small fortune on gas. You're going to save a small fortune on uh, ma manual labor, which is very difficult when you're talking about the crop dusting value of, uh, uh, of visuals. Because that's really what a lot of security systems are in oil and gas for a long time was a crop duster moonlighting, essentially. So instead of the, say, the pathogen, you're going to have a piece of corrosion on a pipe that'll be picked up right away because the temperature will be different. So that's where we're going. That's where we're supposed to go. Now, the last time I talked to um, Goring was a couple of years ago, and he said we're almost there because we have like biodegradable sensors now, which allow things to happen in real time. So we're almost there. We're almost there. But that is the end goal. It's to fly over a pipeline or to fly over a, a row of sunflowers or potatoes or whatever the heck 
and to be able to pinpoint a mineral deficiency, a disease, a single thing. Now, where are we at? Are we there yet? Yeah, well, where, how, how close is science fiction now? Well, you, you, you have quite a bit of uh, uh, precedence with this, but not quite at that granular scale. So uh, take a step back. Let's talk about uh, late 90s, early 2000s when you have um, satellites, you know, the large scale images being taken over massive swaths of land. And you're not seeing high resolution. A pixel represents basically something that's uh, two to three, maybe five times the size of the room that we're in right now. You can't really identify much. Much, but what were you trying to identify at the time? That something was wrong. Not exactly what, but that something was, so that you could uh, equip your uh, agriculturist, your agronomist, with the ability to go out there to the site. So now instead of looking at 1,600 acres, let's look at these five spots of about four or five acres apiece. Now you're able to expedite. Um, their workflow, understand what's going on, they attribute one, represents the same in all of them, and they're able to actually create this prescription. Now let's take a look at that, swap out the components for oil and gas, and you have the same thing. So we recognize that, say, um, a lot of the wellheads, say, from the 70s, for instance, you know, I mean, the, the, a lot of different, uh, you know, regulation was much different back then. People uh, haven't capped some of them. You have brine leakages, things like that. Imagine for a second if you're able to take a medium to high resolution satellite image or an aerial image or a drone image and you're able to detect, say, uh, for instance, that there was uh, an up uptake in um, um, salinity, uh, for instance, you know, you have much more salt here now, take another image in two weeks, and it looks like we have a trending analytic, a growth rate of, say, 15%. It looks like it's going to expand. So you can actually create reclamation opportunities. You can actually take these things, and these are at big scale. Mm -hmm. Now let's take a look at a, a specific pipe, for instance. Now, we don't know exactly where the pipes are. Thank you, North Dakota. We don't know that's something that is, I guess, near and dear. We don't know exactly public knowledge where those pipes are, but someone does, which matters uh, when it comes down to things like these sensors that you put into the ground, these biodegradable sensors. Post them, which are buried under underneath the uh, underneath the earth, that line up with the uh, the particular pipes, and you actually create what we'll call a mesh network uh, that can detect the changes in um, uh, electroconductivity. Uh, could change like how much um, how wet the soil is. And could that be a leak? Could that s simply be water retention after mm -hmm. rain? Could be a combination. Heat we, of the soil. Yeah, heat of the soil. Yeah. We, and we don't need to know. Again, we don't need to know what. We need to know that something did happen, mm -hmm. so that instead of going through 3,000 miles of pipe, we actually go to the specific sites at basically a 6 to 12 inch resolution. Now you, have, you pair this technology with a drone, you're actually able to capture, because uh, these things are biodegradable, it means they don't have a battery uh, inside, which means that they're RFID, which when you fly a drone over the top of them, say 20, 30 feet, you actually get pick up a signal. Mm -hmm. So this thing actually is sustainable, it's, it's, it's fresh, it, can, it actually was made with recycled materials. Folks at NDSU are taking care of that today already, it's one of many groups. So, so you're, you, you fly yeah. the plane over, yeah. and then the, the biodegradable sensor in the ground, which is picking up the information yep. next to the pipe, pops it up to the drone, Yep. The drone then instantly layers that data in with everything that it knows from the past. Yeah. And it says, it's okay, or there's a 4% chance that there's a leak. Yeah. Or well, whatever it is. Whatever they tell yeah. the drone to think. Yeah, or, or at the very least, um, the drone is actually capturing the state in real time. It's, you know, connecting to some type of uh, either cellular network, whatever it is. So you're getting a small bits of information spatially. This point represents this amount of information, the, this thing here. You see this, this, this mm -hmm. spatial map is created, but what really matters is when this information is collected, put into some kind of central repository, some kind of database, whatever it is, that a notification when something is outside of that threshold, it's not just that a notification is created, but who gets it? And mm -hmm. those are the big questions that need to be answered today. Is it, you know, Hess or whoever the, you know, the oil and gas company out there? Who needs to notify? Is it border states for, you know, it's like, say, uh, power lines or whatever, whatever the mm -hmm. industry is? Who needs to be notified and when? And how fast do they need that notification? And what information do they need? All of it's captured, but who needs it? Who needs what and when? Uh, are, the, are the probably the hardest questions that I've answered because a drone is no longer thirty thousand dollars a pop; they're three to five hundred dollars a pop. Right, uh, and that was just in a short five, six, seven year period. I mean, that's that's heroic in terms of technological technological. Advances. You know, I never <laughs> even thought of that too. I mean, yeah. because you're going to have a lot of independent uh, Maverick Pioneer types. Oh yeah, that are going to pick up some of the best data probably <laughs> that a lot of people would want. What are you going to do with it? Yeah, yeah, I mean, what right? What are you going to do with it yeah. all? It's a lot of yeah. sifting. That's for sure. So. Yeah. And 
The other reason why we're talking about this here today, by the way, uh, Anthony Mulzahn with uh, Aegis Flow. Yeah. Aegis right Flow. On. Aegis <laughs> Flow. A E G I S F L O. Okay. Yep. And what this also represents is the evolution of the Bakken workforce. Uh, five years ago, we talked a lot about how these guys aren't slinging chains anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, they are a little, but not really. No, they're not. They, the old kind of the, the the roughneck wildcat type days are, are, are you know, yesterday, really. And yeah. you've got guys now that are working in fracking stations that are able to drill two miles below the earth's surface and then two miles horizontally and hit a pie plate. That's how precise they are with this stuff. So it's it's gotten a lot more artificial intelligence, if you will, a lot more technological. And what we're talking about here is really the changing workforce. And uh, the University of North Dakota and North Dakota State and the entire North Dakota system, actually, is really uh, going to be one of the more emerging job trainers in the nation for oil and gas. The amount of um, information or the amount of investment that's gone into the development of analytics at North Dakota State, for example, the amount of investment that's got in from Northern Grumman and uh, Boeing up at the UND Grand Sky Center, as well as the Energy and Environmental Research Center up at UND, which has every single drilling core sample of oil and gas since 1950, whatever it is, the Laird Library. That's why everybody knows where the oil and gas is in the Bakken. North Dakota has kept soil samples for since the, the 50s, so they know what it is. Once the technology is in place, they're able to go get the oil out. It's heroic. Yeah, isn't it just amazing? <laughs> so t talk to me about what yeah. you're seeing with this young startup in, <laughs> in North Dakota that's happening, because you hear a lot about it. You know, a lot of awards happen, um, national awards as far as North Dakota being, you know, yeah. one of the top startups. But a lot of it has to do with the driving of energy and precision agriculture with technology. So talk to me about that whole scene. You're uh, part of it. You're yeah. part of it. Well, I mean, just, just from my personal experience, so, so uh, back up a little bit, um, um, our team, uh, we actually... Um, we participated in a, uh, um, an accelerator, uh, something that a lot of entrepreneur startups will do. And this one was actually called the Clean Tech Open Accelerator. If you're Clean Tech? Yeah, you know what I'm talking about? No, but it sounds good. Clean yeah, Tech. Well, the, uh, yeah. Sustainability, the idea of the life cycle of a product. So um, <clears throat> I don't know, actually, still to this day, why we got accepted, but I was able to convince them, I guess, that um, we are a software platform that is an advocate for sustainability. And so we actually showed through each of these markets how can drone services, um, this market that is growing fast, $127 billion in the next few years is kind of crazy. For, crazy. for a market that didn't exist a couple years ago um, at all, you know? Um, oh, well, yeah. and, and too, uh, <laughs> Obama signed... Uh, I can't remember when it was with law, but essentially in, by 2020, uh, there's going to be 20,000 drones in the sky. Oh, yeah. So that's how much they're lax in the laws. And so, they I mean, this has been in play for a while. Like I said, I've been covered since 2007. So I've been seeing it coming and coming and coming. And you're going to have deliveries happening. You're going to have surveillance happening. Yeah. Imagine the people that just, I mean, the North Dakota uh, Buffalo Association is doing all kinds of testing with drones right now with herding and counting buffalo. Okay. Oh, yeah. Just yeah. buy some. Yep. Bison. Bison. Yeah. So, I mean, it's it's catching on well outside of precision agriculture and oil and gas. And that's where we're getting at is that, but a lot of it is driven by those two industries. Oh, yeah. You yeah. know, for, for the most part. But um, so what? talk to me about how you guys are, 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 are folding this all in now. Because you guys are, you know, you guys are going in a lot of different directions. Yeah. And so that's why we've tailored it uh, as a marketplace. So we can actually, you know, for the industry that needs to be serviced, uh, for those who need to find the pilot to fly, whatever it is, um, you know, take the example of construction. We need to be able to uh, judge and uh, estimate inventory on the fly uh, how, or how deep this uh, particular pile has uh, uh, been dug into, you know, um, how much, uh, um, you know, how much, uh, how many pipe, how much, how much, how many miles of pipe do we have left on this particular site? You know, uh, what does it look like in real estate? You know, given that that upper edge to be able to get that vanity shot. Uh, um, heck, a uh, good friend of mine, um, uh, Matt uh, from uh, Skyscopes, he actually moved his company out to 
uh, Minot so that he could basically go door to door and chat with the wind farmers because they detect deficiencies, uh, degradations on the blades of these uh, wind turbines. Uh, and I mean that's a that's a tough sell, but that's just one of many. Uh, and that's not to say for the the fact that the you, know, you said twenty thousand. There's only thirty almost thirty five thousand pilots, uh, like commercial drone pilots in the United States. Oh wow! Um, yeah, about a hundred to hundred and fifty are being added every single day. Uh, but the crazy thing is that there's still a shortage of pilots. Uh, I actually look at it as just an inefficiency in people to find a pilot for a particular job. Mm -hmm. But once we do that, um, you're actually going to be able to see these pilots not doing this as some kind of side gig. It's going to be, yeah, I'm pretty good at real estate and I can do some construction. And, you know, yeah, I'll try my hand at uh, helping agriculture detect weeds, insects, or diseases, you know, uh, because I have a particular thermal sensor, whatever it is. Uh, you're going to see multiple industries being um, absorbed as a part of someone's portfolio. Mm -hmm. and, and that's okay. That's a good thing. Um, you know, you... You have these uh, these jack of all trades, these Renaissance uh, drone pilots, if you will, uh, and that's where it's going. It really has to because there's not going to be enough uh, um, opportunities until you centralize um, where all the opportunities need to come from, where they need to go. So, um, I don't know. Uh, what was the question? <laughs> well, I was I was already thinking of my next one, so I I checked out about thirty seconds ago. So I'm glad I, you picked up on too. that. Yeah. That's why we love the the weekly Bach and get together. You know, it's nice and laid back here a little bit. We've got a little backup going. We got the radio. It's the uh, we got the uh, chizzard mug here, which I'm drinking my water out of. I call awesome. him chizzard. And uh, my is that, my is son's that Pokemon. Been, or yeah, my son's a Pokemon player. He was That's uh, awesome. Top eight last year, Madison, Wisconsin Regional, so he's going to go at it again this year. Well, it's the road to Pokemon. We're coming for you, St. Louis. St. Louis, Missouri, <laughs> when awesome. Otis the Pokemon monster comes your way, man, he, uh, he just told me he's got a new deck, Decidueye. I don't know what that means. Sounds powerful. Sounds scary. Sounds, it sounds like it's going to kick some St. Louis butt. So, <laughs> how, how old is uh, He's uh, 11 now. 11. 11 yeah. Oh, my and, word. Um, he, first time he ever played, he got in the top eight. So Wow. Yeah, uh, he's just a nat. Oh, he played chess since age like 15, three, 16 so. year olds, you'd beware. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's a, uh, Anthony Molzon is our guest here today at the Weekly Bach and Get Together. We're talking about uh, UAS in general and how that's being folded into the uh, oil and gas industry. And I say fold it in because it's slowly coming in. I mean, more and more people are adapting it. Uh, I talked with Lynn Helms a few weeks ago. Um, uh, uh, Governor Doug Burgum, they, they obviously uh, affirmed it, but then they also gave some examples. If you go back and take a look at the weekly Bach and get together, you can see we have those in there. Um, this next segment here, because we've got just about five minutes, six, seven minutes left here. Um, and then we're going to let you folks get back to your lunches and everything like that. But uh, we're going to do a little bubble gum for the mind. It's not too often that I get to talk about Moore's Law, uh -huh. which is, is really fun. Okay, so what the very crib notes version of Moore's Law is, is that since like the 60s, we'll say, the size of a processor has reduced in size by half every 18 months. Okay, it gets smaller and smaller and smaller. It started out the size of a car, and now it's, you know, the size of a nanobot. Mm -hmm. And also what happens is that it gets twice as fast every 18 months. So every 18 months, the size goes twice as small, and the speed goes twice as fast. That's a very unique concept that's gone, like, against all laws of everything. That's why we have cell phones in our hand, okay? That's why you have little fit bracelets that tell you your heart rate, et cetera, et cetera. That's why we have drones. Yeah. We'll just, that's why we're doing Facebook Live. You know, okay, that's why we live, that's why your kids have no idea what PBS is and what, what an Atari is and what it commercials are and, you know, that sort of thing. And so anyway, um, bubble gum for your mind. Where I'm going with this, what's going to happen over the next five years is going to be incredible. In fact, yeah. I don't think anybody watching has any idea what's going to happen over the next five years because we are going to fold in so much big data from energy, from oil and gas, from hairstylists, <laughs> from <laughs> Amazon.com, right? Yeah. That's, what's, what's happening is that we're folding more and more of this big data up. And so when you go to your computer and you go to your homepage and all your ads are personalized, you know, because of some Google search you did before, that sort of thing. That's going to happen with so many different aspects of your life. The facial recognition software with Facebook really scares me to the, like, the minority report days. But that's a reality now, folks. So I want to ask you about 
I don't know if you want to take the ethics route or if you <laughs> want to take here's how you're going to make lots of money route, but the change is coming. Oh, yeah. And the average person, it's going to happen so fast that they're not even going to know what's going to happen. So it, it, talk to me about the folding in of all this big data, where, the, where you see it going, because you do understand what I'm talking about. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. actually, there's, there's a real-world example speaking of uh, facial recognition. So there is a, uh, um, a study done. Uh, it was just some news reporter went out. Um, they've got, I think, uh, China has uh, something like um, 40,000, 40, 400,000, something like that, uh, CCTVs across the um, across uh, one of their major cities. And uh, what they did is they this gentleman, he went to the police station and uh, he said, all right, put me on your radar and I want you to go find me. He walks out the door and he basically tries to hide himself from public and through automation, facial recognition software, it took seven and a half minutes to both track down and uh, uh, bring him to jail. In fact, it went so fast that the authorities that picked him up had no idea that this was a stunt that was done and, and treated him to the full six cents because he was a suspect mm -hmm. uh, within the, uh, the Chinese regulation. Seven and a half minutes with uh, basically a couple few hundred thousand uh, CCTVs with facial recognition software s installed working together in a mesh network. And that, uh, that's, that's, <laughs> that's what the guy trying to avoid what he knows. Yeah. Like he knows all that stuff's there and he's trying to avoid it. Yes. And in seven and a half minutes, he slipped up. Yeah, yep. Yeah, it basically, that was all it was. He was like, what is it going to take? And so he was, he was pretty casual with it. But, you know, as far as, uh, you know, from an ethical standpoint, uh, I won't take the stance on that. But there's obviously going to be a financial impact uh, for folks who are, let's say, you know, um, uh, drone service providers, uh, for instance, uh, just in oil and gas, you know, uh, one thing that's big is that uh, these wall heads, these rigs, they go down. Um, there are issues, mm -hmm. and they a lot have a specialty pieces. Imagine for a second if you were able to fly over and get a high resolution image of these particular wells, so you know exactly what materials that you need to bring on site. Or furthermore, you actually fold that in with another technology that is totally decoupled from this conversation is 3D printing. You actually now have custom high resolution, high density 3D printer that can actually print these tools and these materials on site and you can actually have one or two of those within a uh, maybe a, a 30 or 40 mile radius to update all of the rigs to get them in working order. Uh, talk about the O-rings, be able to print those on site. Mm -hmm. These are big things that are changing to, to granularize the, pro, uh, the process but then to expedite the workflow. Two, the, both are happening at the same time and you want to talk about Moore's Law, just, just take it away from technology and reapply it. You're actually going faster by being able to uh, make cheaper materials on site. Um, you're cutting it's out the middleman. Crazy. I mean, yeah. and I mean, like five years ago, yeah. I, I want to say that um, Google challenged the World Health Organization, mm -hmm. or the World Health Organization had to go to Google because Google knew about um, cold outbreaks before anybody uh -huh. because of the Google searches. All the number of people that were searching for home remedies for coughs yeah. and colds and all these different things. So here, are the the people that we pay to keep in track of our lives are actually going to the private business to find things that they're supposed to find out. That's another part that's changing, and that's where the North Dakota Governor Doug Burgum keeps talking about, that the big data is going to change the government, it's going to change the way we do business, and oil and gas has been very upfront saying they're rewriting their business plan right now because they understand how much technology has impacted it. Yeah. Hey, I'm in the media. Listen, the, the LA Times yeah. made money for 110 years, and then the internet came along, and they declared bankruptcy 10 years later. I lost my ass in 2009, 2007, because I invested hundreds of thousands of dollars of the internet when nobody was paying us. So right now, I joked last week, I'm on reinvention of myself number 10 over the last 10 years, because nobody's figured out the media yet. Nobody has. Because we don't know how to make money and how to really create a model that works in the media. So we're trying all these different things. And, you know, and that's what's happening in so many other industries is that they are trying to figure out how to do some things. Now, luckily for oil and gas is they have it figured out. Yeah. And they're just implementing the plan as they go. Um, in the UAS industry, they haven't figured this stuff out yet. They're still figuring out how a lot of the... Um, the, the the logarithms and analogarithms works and everything. I was talking to uh, John Nowitzki from uh, oh, NDSU. Johnny, yep, NDSU. Yep. He's like a godfather over there. He's been doing this stuff for a long time. You know, a big part of it was camera sens uh, sensors. You know, they they were flying miles above Hillsboro, North Dakota, trying to figure out all these different uh, things to do for UAS. 
Well, when the next generation of cameras came along, boy, that made their job so much easier, didn't it? Yeah, and I that mean, was actually with a partnership with uh, Elbit Systems, I believe. Okay. And that actually, they, uh, I think they repurposed the... Uh, the, the Hawk, the, I can't remember from Northrop Grumman or whatever, mm -hmm. and uh, that thing can fly at about 7,000 feet. Uh, it's been uh, basically uh, solar panel arrays. They took all the, mach the machinery out of it. It's got great camera systems. This thing can fly for like, what, something like 16 hours at a time. <laughs> made out of the, like, like, yeah. like uh, <laughs> packing peanuts pretty yeah. much. And the next iteration of it, so this one can only fly at about 7,000, but their goal is to get these things to fly in Class A airspace, which means that they can fly at about 28 to 40,000 feet. And when that happens, and you get two of these flying in tandem, you're going to have perpetual surveillance of basically any geostational, geostationary object you want. If you want to get 24-hour access to, say, the Bakken, for instance, to see degradation changes, you want to be able to own zoom in and see logistical changes between uh, you know someone uh, delivering a shipment to be able to go to the docking station or somewhere in between, you're able to have perpetual access to that because you have birds that are able to stay in the air mm -hmm. because of the sustainable technologies that have been embedded into it. Yeah. And also, also a great camera. Yeah. Brave new world, baby. That's, that's where we're at. That's where we're at. Um, so anyway, that's probably going to do it this week for the weekly Bach and get together. We've got uh, um, science fiction that we're talking about, but it's actually reality and we're here and, you know, I remember, you know, several years ago, three, four years ago, I want to say that the state of North Dakota, they were, they were hiring like, you know, basically crop duster type people that were checking pipes. And it's been fun to see the evolution happen as we've been getting to, you know, the drones coming in to check not only the pipes and the safety and the security and what, all these different things, but it's happening in so many different areas. I'm actually enjoying watching my photographer friends just it's so fun to see people use toys and adults use toys and they go out and you know they get these aerial shots and oh, yeah. they but they know how to wait for the light to come out and they don't rely on photoshop for a lot that's what i mean by my photographer friends those are the ones like you know the people who understand art like, i'm a photographer I yeah know what you mean <laughs> you went to school for it so um Anyway, it's fun. So anyway, that's going to do it this week here. And uh, Anthony, one more time, plug your organization. Thank you for coming out and yeah, uh, talking. Well, so talk a little bit and, and give this guy some business. How, how can people <laughs> give you business? Yeah, well, so um, so we, uh, we're building our platform. It's a marketplace for drone pilots to sell photos and videos be contracted to fly. It's Aegisflow, A-E-G-I-S-F-L-O-W dot com. Uh, my name is Anthony, and honestly, I just want to say thank you for today. This is an absolute pleasure. A lot awesome. of fun. Uh, just kind of a little uh, nonchalant chat. Thank you for uh, listening in, and uh, I look forward to uh, having a conversation with some of the folks out there. So. <laughs>